Well, yeah, thank you, thank you for coming. And we, we can talk about the slides as we go along, or, um, or indeed after, if, if there's some that I haven't talked about or points mentioned. But um, as an introduction to the book, Walls Come Tumbling Down, I originally set out to, uh, do, uh, undi uh, to tell the story of Red Wedge, which I thought was a, a uh, history, cultural history that had largely been ignored uh, since its inception in the summer of 1985, um, and <coughs> organised by Anna Joy David, Billy Bragg and Paul Weller, with a view to offering a cultural response to Thatcherism and a way in which artists and a, a could w see what they could offer to um, to the Labour Party, and they uh, would always say that they were for the Labour Party, but not of the Labour Party. And in uh, and um, and I'll come back later into what Red Wedge um, set out to do, and what the relationship was with the with Labour, and what their achievements were. But that was really the starting point, the genesis of this book. But it became um, immediate, as with any area that you choose to historically research, that the that if that was a 1985 start point, that you can't ever start a history uh, at the point of uh, of a new movement's inception. So um, many of those people involved in Red Wedge had been involved in the um, the women's struggle of the early 80s that was ongoing, obviously, for for many decades. Um, CND, but particularly the miners strike, <clears throat> and then it then became obvious that those people were were hugely influenced and coming out of Rock Against Racism, and when I began to look into Rock Against Racism, which um, pr predates my uh, personal involvement, um, although Red Wedge doesn't, um, I realised that Red Wedge, uh, Rock Against Racism, again, had largely been ignored as a social history, mm -hmm. definitely as a cultural history in the written form. Um, the, 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 the book you could immediately turn to was David Widgery, um, who, would, who wrote Beating Time. And, um, and if you don't, you, I can see by nods that you people are aware of David Widgery as a, an East End GP who had been involved um, in writing and involved in the, the, the 68 um, demonstrations and had been a cultural activist involved with IS, International Socialism, and, and, and became involved in Rock Against Racism soon after its um, birth. Um, but beyond his book, th there was um, the, Robin Denslow, the Guardian writer, had traced, uh, in the book When the Music's Over, had traced the politics and the cultural politics across the world and had given over a chapter um, that included Red Wedge and Rock Against Racism. But beyond that, it's very hard to actually find any mainstream publication that had really given it, uh, Rock Against Racism its due worth. So with a, a slight uh, nervousness, I decided that I would begin the book from that point. And I felt that because I didn't personally have an involvement, it, it, it would seem right of me to try and track down as many of the core people at the heart of Rock Against Racism and get their stories direct from them, which I then set out to do and, and then replicate that modus operandi, if you like, for the two-tone movement, for Rock Red Wedge and what would also form the, the last quarter of the book, Artists Against Apartheid. So in the course of my research, I met with over a hundred different people and and those people I would spend anything from two or three hours to a full day with and in many cases uh, I would go back to and have many many conversations either face to face again in pubs in 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 where it on the telephone wherever and as a result I, I amassed a, an incredible uh, oral history um, and then I then set about putting that into book form um, as a, and, and, and as, you, as you'll see from the book if you, uh, when you look through it, that I chose to do it through all of their words and I uh, make that into a narrative and hopefully a dramatic and engaging narrative where 
it starts off with the words of Red Saunders, it then cuts to a member of the beat, it then goes to a photographer, it then goes to Roger Huddle, it goes through all these people and, and, and through it the history of this of 16 years is told. And, and it had a simple start point and a simple end point. The start point being Eric Clapton at the Birmingham Odeon in August 1976, which I will talk about in a couple of minutes. And the end point uh, being a combination of Nelson Mandela on stage at Wembley Stadium as a free man um, and, and an almost liberated South Africa, but not quite. Uh, and the 1992 general election, which seems the end, which marks pretty much the end of Neil Kinnock's uh, tenure as a leader of the Labour Party. Um, so um, the the book begins with Roger, with Red Saunders saying, "Everything begins with the letter," and this is a letter that Red. Um, and we, we, we do, there is a slide that we're passing by, which is the actual um, letter that Red Saunders wrote. And to the enemy melody maker, sounds socialist worker. Um, and it's a letter in response to Eric Clapton's concert at the Birmingham Odeon in August 76. And at that concert, um, he repeatedly made racist remarks to the audience where he asked the audience to put up their hands if they were um, if they were not white, if they were not from this country, and proceeded to tell them that they needed to go back home, and home being not Birmingham, but where their uh, families were from. And he, in the course of the evening, um, repeated these um, hideous racist remarks. He also um, spoke up for Enoch Powell um, um, and and Enoch Powell, who you no doubt know, had um, eight years earlier made the Rivers of Blood speech in a, uh, and in effect calling for the repatriation of uh, black people. Um, so, and I spoke to two people that, had been, that were a witness to that concert and were actually, one of them was Dave Wakeling, who would go on to form the beat. Yeah, and Dave was, down, was at the front of that gig and at first he said he, they just thought it was the ramblings of a drunk man and they didn't pay that much attention to it. But because it continued over the evening, they began to all start muttering down the front and then get really annoyed. And uh, Dave's kind of a slight... Um, uh, his, his comment at first was, you know, haven't we given, we've given you the steam trade, isn't that enough? You know, let alone that you come and then lambast us all. Um, and he, he makes the point that he thought it wasn't a coincidence that Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech had literally been made on the other side of the road at the Midland Hotel, opposite the Odeon. The other witness that I spoke to was David Corio, who was a photographer at the time and would go on to be a renowned photographer for the music press and take many of the famous two-tone photographs. And he, he, he thought that Clapton was acting like a bad stand-up comic. Uh, it, was his, it was his take on it. But nonetheless, the, the, the concert was reviewed in the, in the music press and Red Saunders read this. And he um, was in rehearsal with his theatre company, uh, uh, cartoon, ca uh, cartoon Clowns. And he said he was going to write a letter of response, which he knocked up quite quickly. He said he, he'd never, ever written a letter before. He wasn't that kind of a person. He really wasn't into it. He'd been a, an activist. And then now he was involved in theatre, which he had been for many years. But he wrote, knocked up a letter in the theatre with the theatre group, and at the end of it, he said that we need a rank and fire movement against the racist poison in rock music. At the end of the letter, it gave a PO box address that he got um, uh, that he got from the SWP, and said, "Can we use that?" And to his surprise, and to the six signatories at the bottom of the letter, to his and their utter surprise, they were inundated with handwritten letters. It, they're in the hundreds, and I've seen them all. In fact, ro th there's a Rock Against Racism archive that I uh, was given, and within that was every letter that had ever been sent to Rock Against Racism. And it starts with these letters saying, I was at the Birmingham concert too, it was disgraceful. And it ends up with letters 
from Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and this is over the years of Rock Against Racism's existence, which goes on ostensibly to 1982, um, but it's pretty much um, crumbling by 80-81. But there's, it's incredible to see all these letters. So that really is the start of Rock Against Racism. And I then, as you imagine, meet the core people who begin to have meetings um, in, in Soho, in a building that beneath has got uh, ladies of the night so when the raw people used to come to meet they would let Endersy get propositioned uh, as they came in and it um, and it was also the uh, it was red studio but it was also the studio of Gerard Mankiewicz who had been on tour with the Rolling Stones in America who had taken front covers of the Rolling Stones who had photographed Jimi Hendrix and um, red um, Gerard fondly remembers that there's a, a kind of a curtain that separated his photographic studio, an old boxing ring. And on the other side of the curtain was the kitchen and some old um, uh, set, uh, sofas and stuff. And the raw lot would be busy having meetings and shouting the odds in a very positive way about how things go were going. And on the other side, he would play records of whoever the pop star of the day is that he uh, was, for t was taking a picture of. And he kind of remembers... Kate Bush and Wuthering Heights uh, are being played as there's a Ra meeting going on behind the curtain. Uh, and, and so Ra basically come up with a lovely formula that is quite revolutionary for the time. And, it, and it's this, that they were put on concerts and uh, gigs and they would invite a reggae band and they would invite a punk band. And this would become their statement that a white invariably punk band would play first a black reggae band would play and at the end they would ask both sets of musicians to come on stage at the end of the evening and jam and that would be the statement of rock against racism that black and white can both share a stage with their own bands and can literally come together on a stage and that and that that would be the extent of the political argument of of a of a concert where that then changes is the um, introduction of temporary hoarding. And this will be the, um, and we keep on seeing front covers of temporary hoarding. And it's, um, and it's within temporary hoarding, which is a fanzine, which is about this size, uh, this size. And if you, if you ever remember it or you had copies, it would always unfold. And um, I have a complete set of the temporary hoardings. Wow. And it would become a poster, um, and the idea being that you put it on the wall. But all the arguments of the era would be within those pages. And the arguments would, of course, be racism. There would also be gender arguments. There'd be arguments about Northern Ireland, um, Zimbabwe. Political issues of the debate day would you, were written about by the Ra uh, collective which was in fact by the temporary hoarding collective which does cross over with the Ra collective but is slightly different in itself um, and this was and this would um, be printed at the SWP print shop they would pay maybe for a thousand copies they would go that six thousand were given to them and those would be you know whisked off and ran the country um, and uh, uh, so that's, that's a, a very um, educational agitprop is what they called it and it becomes a, a very, very um, important part of Rock Against Racism. But of course, and the, and I could, so I trace the history of uh, Rock Against Racism's e evolution. I also spoke to many, many um, musicians um, and particularly I spoke to reggae musicians because I felt it was important that it, this wasn't a white person's history mm -hmm. it was an equally a black person's history so I, I, I spoke to members of Aswild and Misty and Roots and Matumbi and, um, and, and Linton Kwesi Johnson um, var various people and, and what, what was fascinating about talking to those people was they provided a, 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 a horrific if you like, history of what their experience of Britain was from being born in Britain or coming over with their parents at a young age and 
what it meant to be um, educated in schools um, and then go on to youth clubs and socialise uh, with white people and how there was a natural socialisation going on if you like but equally at the same time as you'll all be aware um, through this period is the rise of the National Front and so you get this contradiction of white and black people coming together in social situations and, a, um, and an organisation that is intent on trying to make um, Britain uh, a white only country um, the, the, uh, before it kind of really gets into the meat and veg, if you like, of uh, Rock Against Racism, the book talks about the various demonstrations and the rise of the National Front and talks about Wood Green, which Keith was telling me is going to be the anniversary of which is um, of, uh, this year on the 23rd of April, and that's going to be marked. Um, but that was the first what Keith actually said was the first major um, demonstration, anti-fascist demonstration, uh, perhaps, or major demonstration since 68. Uh, um, we also, that then, uh, later that year, uh, 77 in August, is the Lewisham demonstration. But the key thing about Lewisham in terms of rock against racism is that the national, is that the uh, enemy write up Lewisham. Mm. And they write it up in terms of rock against racism uh, and the headline they give it is dedicated followers of fascism and they and the and the article ends in saying thank god for rock against racism we need to get behind them and it re it's really at that point that something turns although rock against racism are put on concerts at the roundhouse and there's been gigs around the country and organize and, and small gigs have, have happened after Lewisham, there's a turn and they decide to put on a major carnival. And equally at the end of Lewisham um, is the establishment of the Anti-Nazi League. And in the book I spoke to Paul Holborough and I speak to Peter Hayne and I speak to Neil Kinnock, who, who were all on the original steering committee of um, the Anti-Nazi League. And it also is... Um, the, the beauty of this book is, is everybody contradicts everybody. <laughs> so where one person says this definitely happened, somebody else will say this definitely didn't happen. You definitely said this, he definitely didn't say this. You know, and there's a lot of humour in that and I purposely kept it in. But what p people can't deny is events that happened and they can't deny that the, the first major carnival for Rock Against Racism in, in Victoria Park happened just before the May Day elections in 1978. And it is, in, it is an incredible happening and an incredible story. And um, Red Saunders talks about that he's walk, he, he can't sleep and he goes down early to Trafalgar Square and on his, it, there's not very really many people milling around so he goes off for a chip butty and a cup of coffee and he comes back and suddenly there's coach loads coming from Aberystwyth and Scotland and Tyneside and Cornwall and they're falling out, these, all these punks are falling out of the coaches and smoke from all the, they've been smoking since the early hours and, and, and Trafalgar Square uh, fills up and Peter Hayne talks about that he's been to many many demonstrations in Tra Trafalgar Square but he's never seen anything like this the, 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 the square is full of lollipops with the ANL and the RA logos on it and and uh, and meanwhile, if you, if you can imagine a film, if you cut to to um, seven miles away in the East End, um, Roger Huddle, who's of the uh, SWP, is standing on a stage expecting maybe ten thousand people to turn up, but at the moment there's there's no more than two or three hundred people, and it's getting towards one o'clock. And the first act of the day, X-Ray Specs are due on stage and he just thinks the whole thing is going to be an utter disaster. And he introduces X-Ray Specs and they come on stage. And, and yet, yeah, mass disappointment. As the, as the song ends and they go to do their second song, the march arrives and the march doesn't stop as 80,000 people fill Victoria Park. And, and the, the largest uh, anti-fascist demonstration I think ever then happens on that field with the Clash playing, Steel Pulse playing, 
Tom Robinson's band playing. And there's all kind of shenanigans that go on on stage, including uh, the pulling of the plug uh, on uh, Ra's orders to cut off the clash because they're, they're purposely playing over their allotted time. And that, that's quite a little story. But I should jump on from all of that. And um, what really happens with um, Rock Against Racism is um, there's a carnival in Manchester, there's a, a repeat carnival where 150,000 people turn up in Brixton at Brockwell Park. Um, in the following year, in 1979, there's, this is, raw people, all of them want, wanted to stress to me that Ra was about grassroots. It, it wasn't about Paul McCartney or the big names that were, as Peter Hain confirms, approached to do Ra concerts. But it was decided that Ra should remain a grassroots organisation. And to do that, they uh, send out Wayne Minter to go around and find all the Ra groups around the country, which by 79 are numbering between 50 and 100. And they, the idea is that they connect them all up and offer a tour that goes around, which is called the Militant Entertainment Tour. And, and, uh, and that's a, a fascinating tour. Um, and again, ends in up a, with a big spectacular at Ali Pali, a whole day spectacular. Um, and Ra continues on until the uh, Leeds, the final carnival is in Leeds, and it's significant because the headline act of the day are the specials, and the specials are just about to get to number one with Ghost Town. Um, which is also the end stage of the first phase of two turn. Often when you hear about uh, Ra and you hear about two turn is that Rock Against Racism ended and the baton was passed on to two turn. In fact, two turn runs underneath Rock Against Racism. Mm -hmm. um, so the middle section of the book is about two turn, but it's not so much about the label and the band, uh, it's about the politics of Two Tone. And it really, and, and uh, Two Tone, the importance of it is Jerry Dammers, because Jerry Dammers was hugely influenced by Rock Against Racism. He went to Rock Against Race, Racism concerts in Coventry and saw Misty and Roots. Um, but he has the idea to set up a multicultural band uh, in Coventry. Um, he, his memory is there weren't very many black musicians playing with white musicians in Coventry, but he wants to put together a band um, of those two types of people, and, um, or colours of skin, if you like. And although that's not unprecedented in, in, the mu uh, in British music, there has never been a mainstream band that will go on to have the success of the specials um, and so having succeeded in putting together the specials and then um, having the idea to set up a, a record label, an independent record label, which is again a rev quite a revolutionary act in, uh, in 1978. The record will come out in 1979, in March, um, in March of 79, uh, which they fund, the specials fund themselves. They record a single, Gangsters, but they don't then have enough money to put a B-side on this single they're going to press. And uh, two of Jerry's mates have recorded a song, and that gets stuck on the B-side, uh, as and it's a track called The Selector. And oh, uh, you. Have you? Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you got the hand-printed front yeah, cover? Yeah, yeah. Have you? Yes. Oh, yeah. brilliant, which, is, which isn't <laughs> coming up, is it? Yeah. Well, that's worth a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and because they didn't have a name for the band, they called the band The Selector. And there's only two, there's only two people on that record. So Neil Davis, who wrote the song, then has to go and form a band called The Selector, uh, which they do. And, uh, and the final person in the jigsaw of uh, Puzzle of the Band is Pauline Black. And she, she then uh, becomes the figurehead, if you like, of, of Two Tone and, uh, and the band The Selector. Um, there aren't with two turn. There aren't any contracts, and there aren't any real. Um, there's nothing really set down as to how two turn is going to operate, except for the fact that they managed to get a deal with Chrysalis, 
which gives them £10,000 and the right to put out 10 more singles and £1,000 for each of those bands to record. Um, each of the members of the selector and the two turn uh, and the specials form uh, the, the loosely what you might call the cooperative or the directorship of, of, of two turn and each have an equal say because Jerry Dammers purposely sets out to establish a socialist record label um, without, without the contract becomes problematic in the end because as you, as you can imagine Jerry Dammers soon becomes a pop star and he nothing can happen in two turn without his say so and uh, and it's kind of a when the in the first throes of success all is well mm -hmm. when money and fame enter into the equation J Jerry's um, status amongst some of the members of the band starts to diminish it, it to, to a certain uh, degree and also his ability to call the artistic shots uh, is called into question, despite the fact that the specials um, output is unrelenting uh, in its success. Um, and um, number one single with Too Much Too Young, and then at the end of their career, number one single, as I mentioned, with the two with uh, Ghost Town. Um, and so I very much enter into with all the mem with many members of the specials, many men members of Madness, Selector, Beat. Body snatchers. Uh, I talk about the politics and the class, uh, class issues, education issues, money issues, drug issues. In fact, all, all the things that are happening in the two tone movement in the wider society are in hap are in fact being happening and are being tested day by day by the bands themselves. None more so than in the selector where there's um, six black members and one white member. There's middle class and working class and different political beliefs and they're all rubbing up against one another. And it's a fascinating insight, if you like, from not only the selector but the two-tone bands to say uh, from the stage and from behind the scenes, is it possible to live out the ideas of two-tone actually within the bands themselves and it proves um, it really proves it isn't possible and they end up all falling apart I also use the opportunity to really look at the role of women in this period and um, and and that and that uh, is it is through the uh, through Pauline Black through Rhoda Dacca through Nikki Summers who set up the body snatchers and the Body Snatchers are an all-female group, seven members. Um, and again, you, you've got people that are, are, are coming from very, very rich backgrounds to people that are coming off the street. And there's a real clash in that kind of culture between that idea of um, what are you fighting for if you've always been given everything to people who are fighting because they've never had anything. And eventually that... the, the the fight in the body snatchers almost that causes the split is a decision to either become a pop band or to to ultimately record what is their most devastating song which is a song called the, the boiler. boiler which was a body snatcher song before it becomes a special aka recorded song and the body snatchers is i think one of the most remarkable recorded piece of music in the history of pop music or any music in that it's a spoken word account of a rope and over a, a, a piece of music um, Rhoda Dacca recounts um, be, being, pick, uh, being picked up, being followed, being uh, sexually abused and, in, and the record ends in a minute of Rhoda Dacca in character screaming and um, as Phil Jupiter's in the book uh, says it's a it's a record you listen to once and it, and it, it's not a record you can listen to again but 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 it charts which is uh, and and it's played on the radio it gets onto the TV um, and 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 it, it and it opens up a debate about um, uh, sexual abuse 
which is an incredible thing for a record and a fine moment in Two Tones history. Um, let me talk about the link out of Two Turn and simultaneous with Two Turn. C and D has picked up an incredible following, and I, I, the the main person that I spoke to was the uh, one of the, the vice president of Youth C and D, Anna Joy David. Um, she becomes a really integral pe uh, person within the last third of the book, non more so because she she gets invited to go and do a talk in a park in Hyde Park, in fact. Um, and she's only 17 and when she turns up there's a quarter of a million people there and she's uh, so she talks this crowd and it's recorded and goes out live on um, LBC and listening to LBC is Paul Weller um, who's in the jam the biggest band of the time and he phones up CND and said whoever that person was on the radio I'm f backing and she gets introduced to Anna Joy David, and Anna Joy David, who th that was her we just saw on the telephone, she has no idea who Paul Weller is or who the jam is. <laughs> and the jam ended up playing on the back of a lorry for CND, um, and they form a um, political partnership which um, will, once they um, come on board with, Paul, with Billy Bragg, is the, is the core of what Red Wedge is. But What's crucial and critical to Red Wedge is that during the minor strike and because of CND, artists broadly of the left have been doing lots of lots of uh, campaigning gigs and they're all meeting one another on, the, uh, on marches and at these concerts. And when the minor strike is lost, uh, Billy Bragg basically says t to all his musical community, what are we all going to do? You know, do we go back to our wacky haircuts and being on the page of smash hits or do we do something about it and seize this moment in history to do something that no pop star has ever tried to do which is if where is all political movement uh, pop music political history has been anti-establishment and on the outside of, uh, of parliamentary politics the musicians involved in Red Wedge say, let's accept that we have an opportunity to step inside Westminster. Literally, they do. They go into the Shadow Cabinet Office and they try and affect from within, as an experiment, can, can we make something happen? And what they, um, they, they remain independent from the Labour Party. They're given tremendous backing by Neil Kinnock, who... Um, immediately recognises the power of music and culture and offers them a room in Woolworth Road, Labour Party headquarters. And what Red Wedge say is that all us as musicians, comedians, artists, anybody culture of the left, we will give of what we can of what we have of our own ability, which is we will go and do tours music tours, we will go and do comedy tours, we will do art exhibitions, we will make films and we will do two things. We will try and get young people to be politically motivated and we will also get young people to register to vote. In this period, 6 million 18 to 24 year olds are unregistered to vote. And almost half of the of 18 to 24 year olds are not um, are not using their right to vote either. Um, out of of this agreement, in to, in, re, in return, Red Wedge say we want influence on Labour Party policy, and they mainly with the. Um, uh, the writing skills of Neil Spencer, who has been the editor of NME from since 1978 through to 85, who then leaves and becomes the press officer for Red Wedge, they draw up a manifesto. Um, and the manifesto, which I've read, um, it, it is not a pop star's manifesto. It's hard uh, um, ideological argument broken down into all the different categories of society and cogent arguments made for what 
they want the Labour Party to do. And um, there's there's strong argument for gay rights, uh, for green issues, um, for youth training schemes, and they make these arguments uh, primarily with Anna Joy David, but also with Peter Jenner, who's Billy Bragg's manager. And Peter Jenner's history goes back through Ian Jury, The Clash, um, and to putting on the free concerts in Hyde Park, putting on the Rolling Stones and managing Pink Floyd. So that, and, and the youngest person ever to become a lecturer at LSE. Um, so they've got a hell of a lot of academic and intellectual weight behind them. And the, so the arguments that they're putting forward directly to Neil Kinnock's office, I've read many of the exchanges, and it's hard political argument. Um, um, and this all happens while the jovality of the tours happen. Um, I then talk, I've talked about both strands of that in the book and also the uh, militant, militant entertainment which sets out to try and disrupt uh, to a large degree Red Wedge and there's, um, uh, and, and which uh, happens in Newcastle and there's a bit of a uh, bit of a, an issue goes on uh, goes down there at Newcastle University before the main gig and after which all gets examined um, the, the, the two major things that happen with Red Wedge one of them is the day events and I get, there's a chapter on the day events and I think this is the, the key part of Red Wedge is that Anna Joy David um, organises the event on the afternoon whenever there's a concert happening in the evening. And the afternoon is inv an invited audience of uh, disenfranchised young people who are invited to come to church halls, youth halls, and, and, um, and the, sometimes the attendance is up to, the thousand, up to a thousand. And what they meet is a local MP, a national MP, and pop stars. And a debate happens. And those debates the, and the, the frustrations of, 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 the, of the young people are then directly fed back to the Shadow Cabinet Office. And they're incredible. Um, it was an incredible idea and it was successfully executed. And, it's a, and, and it's a, it was a real wonder to find out about these and to, to, to then write about it. And so the Red Wedge story actually continues into... Uh, 1990, 91, 92, and 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 two. Um, there's two major pieces. There's uh, the, there's a document you're about to see, and it's is issued from the Shadow Trade and Industry, and it's and it's an, a, a document from Gordon Brown. You might have noticed, and, um, and and in the first paragraph of Gordon Brown's letter, he states that this is the first time that a major political party has made. Uh, a, uh, has written a document on the importance of the music industry and then it goes on to, to outline what the Labour Party is going to do for the industry um, and, and, and it's a vindication, as Neil Kinnock says, of, um, that's Tom Watson by the way, uh, of, uh, uh, of a vindication of what Red Wedge has been trying to achieve. Also, the, Neil Kinnock says that in the 1992 uh, manifesto and what was written up for when Labour, if they had won and taken taken office, was included uh, included on the front bench a minister for youth. Again, he says a, an absolute vindication of everything that uh, Red Wedge had tried to do since 1985. Um, so that's the document, uh, the manifesto of Red Wedge, which was launched at um, Ronnie Scott's, uh, um, and. Baroness Healy talks about an event on that on that launch day, um, and 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 then to wrap to, to wrap up my my talk, the my final section of the book is as I alluded to is 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 the chart, quite quite um, uh, it's not it's 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 a small chapter but it's to chart the inauguration of Artists Against Apartheid, which is Jerry Dammers initiation and leads to the, the Wembley concerts, one to celebrate, the first one to celebrate Nelson Mandela's 70th birthday, the second one because Nelson Mandela is then a free man. But the point of doing that was where in the, in the beginning, in the opening chapters of the book, we get a, a real feeling of the everyday racism of the mid-1970s, whether it's through 
the black and white minstrel show or Jim Davison or um, uh, racism in pubs as common talk um, that, that a switch has happened where 16 years later th largely I think through the cultural activities of, what, of activists and pop stars and politicians in this whole period a youth generation regards racism as, as or, or rather regards anti-racism as being hip as being the way to be and that is demonstrated I think through the anti-artists anti against apartheid concerts um, and it's an incredible journey I would say from Clapton's racism through to Mande Mandela standing on stage as a free man and this concert you're about to see where uh, this is Clapton Common now uh, where a quarter of a million people came in 1986 um, Prior, this is prior to the, 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 this concert now, which Jerry Dammer sets up before the uh, Wembley concerts. And, um, and so, yeah, that's the broad outline of, of what's in Walls Come Tumbling Down, uh, Come Tumbling Down. <coughs> um, and, uh, yeah, so uh, I think that'd be a good point, really, to kind of conclude my, my monologue. <laughs>